Our text today comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20, starting in verse 20. As you turn in your Bibles, I will provide some context. Paul is in a Roman prison, and he says in chapter 4, verse 6, the time of my departure has come. So Paul writes as a dying man to a spiritual son. He encourages Timothy to mature, to correct false teachers, and to preach the word. Although Paul writes specifically to Timothy, he writes with a broader audience in mind. Look at chapter 2, verse 2. Paul says, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So, Paul expects Timothy to share these things with others who will in turn share these things with others. These things with others. <laughs> these things with others. He even says in chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So, everything we learn here has relevance and application to your life, even if you're not in Timothy's shoes. Timothy had to deal with false teachers in Ephesus. He also had to pastor those who were under the influence of false teachers. How Christians responded to this situation was a test of courage and kindness. Starting in verse 20, let's read. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. The great house, in verse 20, is the same as God's firm foundation, you see that phrase in verse 19, which is the church of God. We know this because of a parallel passage in 1 Timothy 3.15 where Paul speaks of, quote, the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. The master that we are to serve, that we are to be useful to, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul uses the term vessel elsewhere in different ways, but in this context, he has an eye on the teachers of the church. Although, as I noted, the general principles here apply to all Christians. There are different kinds of vessels in your house, some for noble use, some for menial use, some clean others unclean. You probably have a stack of nice, clean dishes, plates at home, which if uh, you had a guest come over, you'd serve them dinner with this. But you probably also have, some of you, a weak old sippy cup with milk in it underneath a couch that you can't find. Yeah, when you have kids, dishes find their way all around the house and Perhaps you have a sink of dirty dishes. Some items you bring out for special occasions. Others you use for more base things like storing trash. Some commentators think that the vessels here refer to healthy and unhealthy believers. Others think that they refer to true and false teachers. Paul is hopeful that even the unclean vessels can be cleansed. And they are all in the great house, the church. So I take these to be at least inclusive of healthy and unhealthy believers. Either way, the illustration of being cleansed for noble use is applicable to all of us. Some vessels are submissive and obedient and useful to the master, others not. Some are available and ready and zealous, while others are out of commission and unusable. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. He said, you are the light of the world. We Christians, we don't want to lose our saltiness. 
We don't want our lights to be dimmed or covered. We want more fire, more zeal, more readiness, more effectiveness. We want to say, Jesus, sign me up. I want my life to count. I don't want to waste my life. We will give an account. And we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So we want to be clean and ready and sharp and available, but not everybody in the church is ready for service. Some genuine believers are effectively benched. But Paul is hopeful. He is redemptive. You are not a lost cause. Look at verse 21. What should a person do to be a vessel for honorable use? To cleanse himself from what is dishonorable. How can we do this? I want to answer this in five ways from the text. The first way is to pursue Christian virtue with, per, with pure-hearted believers. So for the note-takers out there, number one, pursue Christian virtue with pure-hearted believers. Look at verse 22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Youthful passions are strong, <clears throat> disorderly desires associated with immaturity. They come from self-indulgence, selfish ambition, and arrogance. To flee them is to completely shun them. You have bound up within your flesh carnal desires that you need to run away from as fast as you can. Paul even says in Romans 8, put to death the deeds of the flesh. The alternative to these youthful desires is to be in hot pursuit of something else. Pursue here means to go hard after something. And Paul would have us strain with eagerness after real moral change. Righteousness faith, love, and peace. That we would have an interior purity and holiness and childlike trust and supernatural confidence in the promises of God. And a love for our neighbors and even for our, our enemies and a special affection for fellow believers and an inner settled peace that seeks unity and fellowship and harmony. But how? How? Look at verse 22 again. With those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Now, you might be asking, how on earth can I know whether or not someone else has a pure heart? Only God can judge, right? Yes, only God can judge like God can judge. Only God knows the heart like God knows the heart. But Jesus did say, by, your, by their fruits you shall know them. In the book of 1 John, we're taught that we can know who is born again by their confession, by their obedience, and by their love. Even if this is a fallible knowledge, it is an actionable knowledge. An immediate application here is to attach yourself to a local church of which you can say in good conscience that the whole of them worship the Lord Jesus Christ from a pure heart. It's the kind of church that when you hear the world say, Christians are disingenuous, they're fundamentally hypocritical, that you can say, not my local church. These people love the Lord Jesus Christ with a pure and genuine heart. And you can say with David from the Psalms, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. <clears throat> Christians only have three options. We can find a local church with pure-hearted believers, or if you're qualified, you can plant one, or you can move. We move for jobs. Why wouldn't we move, if we needed to, to be attached to a pure-hearted local church? Another application is to work hard at making relationships with pure-hearted believers. Step out. Take the initiative. Make some friends. Don't let your personality here be an excuse. 
the church cannot hold your hand the whole way, but it does provide some helpful on-ramps. I like that term, on-ramps. My friend Rich taught me that term. It refers to the kinds of hosted or organized events that the church puts on for you to create relationships with other believers. We have a Saturday morning men's ministry here at Faith Community Church. We have the ladies sip and chat. We have small groups, and if you're not in a small group, I encourage you to email the elders, knock on their door twice, thrice if you need to, be the persistent widow, do what you need to do to find a small group. I know we're trying to create more of them for you. We also, in the church, have some informal texting groups. I'm not sure if you know that. One of the first things I did when I came to Faith Community Church was join an ad hoc, informal texting group with a few other men so that we could keep each other accountable, confess our sins, encourage each other with the gospel. You don't need uh, any organization to do that. Just find a few friends in Christ and start asking each other, how can I pray for you? And start texting each other uh, throughout the week prayer requests and encouragement. You're supposed to pursue Christian virtue with other pure-hearted believers. Men, find your squad. You cannot be friends with a hundred men, but you can find a few men to lean on who will stimulate and inspire and stir you up to love and good works and faithfulness. A lot of the Christian life is taught, and a lot of the Christian life is caught. Find pure-hearted believers that will be a good influence on you. Pastors, by the way, need this too. But if you isolate yourself, if you sequester yourself from the life of the body of the church and relationships with pure-hearted believers, you will atrophy you will be like a coal taken out of the fire. Your light will dim. You will grow cold. You will lose your saltiness. You will become an unclean vessel. You will not be useful then to the Master. And you will not be ready for every good work. The second way we are to be cleansed is to avoid foolish controversies. So number two, avoid foolish controversies. Look at verse 23. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. The word for controversy here can be rendered investigation, discussion, debate, or speculation. A controversy can be foolish when it lacks substance or meaningful content. It is reduced to vain words and meaningless verbiage. Paul mentioned earlier in chapter 2 a quarrel about words. Why quarrel about words when the words cease to be meaningful? Paul says in chapter 2 verse 14 that such a quarrel, quote, does no good, but it ruins the hearers. It puts a sour taste in someone's mouth, or even having an important or difficult conversation. And Paul says that this kind of irreverent babble leads people into more and more ungodliness. He says, their talk will spread like gangrene. It's like an awful bacterial infection that spreads and destroys people. Other times, a controversy can be foolish because of the person that you're speaking to is conceited or stubbornly ignorant. Proverbs 18.2 describes a fool who takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Paul describes a typical false teacher in 1 Timothy 6, verse 4. He is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and, a, and for quarrels, about words. Such controversies are like a greenhouse, which easily produce, quote, envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions. Wow, the Bible gives us such a great vocabulary 
for virtue and vice, does it not? The world's vocabulary is so inadequate and so pitiful. We ought to just absorb as much as we can from, say, the book of Proverbs and the rest of Scripture to give us a rich vocabulary for seeing the world. So he says, evil suspicions and a constant friction among people who are deprived in mind, depraved in mind, and deprived of the truth. It sure sounds like Paul has been put through the ringer with some very divisive people. Paul gives a protocol for dealing with divisive people in Titus 3, verse 10. He says, As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. These people are not worth it. Remember what Jesus said. He said, Do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So learn to identify swine. If you look down at chapter 3, verse 2, Paul speaks of those who are proud, arrogant, abusive. He goes on, slanderous, without self-control, <clears throat> brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with deceit, sorry, conceit. He, he says later, avoid such people. Other times the content of a controversy is meaningful and important. It's worth having, but it's not worth having now. This might be because of doctrinal triage. This refers to a hierarchy of doctrines. Some matter more, some matter less. Keep the main thing the main thing. There is a time and place for addressing each important issue. But we don't want to quarrel about hot topics when there is a more underlying, fundamental, first-order issue that needs to be addressed. As an example, maybe we should avoid quarreling with family or friends about hot topics like vaccines or masks or a divisive politician if we can have a more needed conversation about the gospel. Learn to say no. Some arguments are not worth having. Don't be drawn into them like a moth to the flame. There is a youthful, immature desire in the flesh that loves controversy. Also, love, learn to overlook the foolish opinions of those you love. Peter says, Love covers a multitude of sins. Proverbs 10.12 Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Treasure your relationships and don't burn bridges by needless quarreling. This principle of overlooking foolish positions is really helpful in evangelism. Um, I've been on the street before and we're listening to a believer, uh, sorry, to an unbeliever speak for a few minutes and you hear him say three four, five things that are awful, that need to be corrected, and perhaps there's a new believer there who's shadowing the evangelism and is there learning how things run, and this newcomer hears this unbeliever say five different things, and he wants to jump in and, and correct every single one of them, and he listens to the evangelist. Just listen. And he picks one thing, and he slowly and kindly engages the most important issues. And he lets four other issues just slide because he's not inclined to quarrel. He's trying to patiently and kindly teach. Also learn to receive a brother. There's a, a passage in Romans 14, verse 1, where Paul says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him but not to quarrel over opinions. The context is a dispute about whether meat that had been sacrificed to idols and then sold in the marketplace could be purchased and eaten. Some genuine believers who loved the Lord had a super big problem with this. And Paul explains, you can eat the meat, receive it in thanksgiving, uh, it don't, don't be bothered in your conscience about this, 
But if you have a brother who has a super big problem with this, don't mock them. Don't, don't needlessly offend them. Uh, accommodate them. Receive them. Paul says, welcome such a brother, but don't set up a trap for him to have a debate and humiliate him for having a foolish or weak opinion. Learn to delay having some conversations. Maybe say, hey brother, I don't think we're in a good place to have this conversation. Why don't we sleep on it? Let's do some more reading. And then maybe let's talk about it in a few weeks. We don't need to permanently shelve this It's an important issue. We should talk about it. But maybe we're not in the best place. Maybe we should do some more preparation. We can delay it for the sake of peace and prayer. And insist on boundaries in conflict. Christians should excel in courteous and kind conflict resolution. Bitterness, steamrolling, screaming, fits of rage, rudeness, or abusive speech should be completely off the table. Say, I love you, and I refuse to have this conversation if we're not both going to exercise basic courtesies. I don't want to quarrel with you. By the way, isn't it a blessing to find a friend in Christ who you can hash issues out with while maintaining warmth and Christian camaraderie? Some of my best friends in life we have been able to hash out all sorts of issues and maintain sweet friendship. The third way we can be cleansed and ready for every good work and useful to the Master is to teach our opponents with patience and kindness. So number three, teach opponents with patience and kindness. Look at verse 24 with me. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. The Lord's servant here refers to Timothy and other teachers of the church. To be quarrelsome means to be given over to uh, heated disputes. To be kind means to be mild. Paul uses this same word in 1 Thessalonians 2.7. Excuse me. He says, but we were gentle among you, same Greek word, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. That the Lord's servant must be able to teach reminds us again that Paul is speaking especially to pastors of the church. To be able to teach, if you remember, is a requirement of an overseer given in 1 Timothy 3. So, not, of a, not all of us are in ministry, and not every context is appropriate for every Christian to teach in. But again, every Christian can apply the code of conduct that we're learning from Paul here. Look at the phrase, patiently enduring evil. This comes from a single Greek word, and it can be translated, bearing evil without resentment. John Stott describes it as forbearing other people's unkindness, patient toward their foolishness, and tolerant of their foibles. And then look at the word gentle or gentleness. To be gentle means to show humility and courtesy. It is to be considerate and meek. I love this passage, verses 24 and 25, and I love to apply it to evangelism. There's two main temptations when experiencing the stress of opposition that comes from teaching the truth about the gospel. It's to either become uncharitable or cowardly with respect to being uncharitable. There is a kind of wretched urgency that an evangelist or a teacher can rationalize. It goes like this. Um, You're rejected, you're mocked, you're dismissed, and you think, what I have to share is so important, and the stakes for receiving this is so high, 
that I can go beyond Christian dignity, that I can become impatient and rude and belligerent and unkind. To my shame, I have done this before, and I have had to receive forgiveness from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul will not have any of this caustic discourtesy. Instead, a Christian is to maintain his composure and to act with dignity and patience and kindness. The other temptation is to be a coward. This is certainly the more culturally respectable sin. It reasons like this. Hey, if I share the truth, if I teach, if I even correct my opponent, I'm going to suffer and there will be tension and the fallout and the risk is so great that I choose instead to be silent. And this person reasons, since being silent will remove the tension, I can call my silence kindness. I've seen this in Utah where people, instead of doing evangelism, they choose instead of ecumenical, mutual, interfaith, comparative religious dialogue, where you say, let's just both learn from each other, and we'll both be better off from it. You share your perspective, I'll share my perspective. You see where I'm going with that? It's different from evangelism. It's different from teaching and correcting and asserting and declaring and proclaiming. It it loses the the quasi-ecumenical, mutual, interfaith dialogue where you're just sharing opinions. It It releases the tension, but it stops being faithful to the kind of content you have to share. The the authority to which we appeal is not fitting for a mode of speech that treats your religion like a mere perspective or viewpoint. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word, but by open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So Paul's mode of speech is open statement of the truth. It's straightforward. This is why I don't like stealth evangelism. I don't like to be crafty. I don't like to trick people into hearing the gospel. I don't like to weave it in like a car salesman. I want to be direct and I want to go after the conscience. Sharing the gospel presses the conscience. Preaching does this too. It presses you to make a decision. It forces upon you this reality that I must decide now whether to receive the Word of God as the Word of God. Paul would not have us fall off either side of the horse. Christian teachers are to be persistent in teaching and correcting with kindness and patience fully aware of the unpleasant consequences. Scott Swain writes, Patience is not quietism. It is a mode of action necessary for playing the long game in the face of opposition. Christians play the long game. We want our patience and kindness in teaching and correcting to outlast the opposition. Notice also that Paul assumes pushback. Even when you're being kind and gentle, you will get pushback. Being kind and gentle won't necessarily fix the problem of others mistreating you. Paul says in chapter 4, verse 5 to Timothy, Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. Also, these opponents, they won't necessarily always feel loved by you. John Piper writes, 
True love pursues a person's lasting good, but the one loved may not care about the good. Thus, love may feel unloving. Also note here that the teaching in view here is not just positive. Look at verse 25. Correcting his opponents with gentleness. This teaching is corrective when necessary. Paul writes in chapter 4, verse 2, Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Also note here that Paul speaks of real opponents. I wonder if that kind of language bothers you. Consider Romans 9. Paul speaks of his kinsmen, his fellow Jews. He says he has great sorrow and unceasing anguish for his fellow Jews. He wishes he could take their place. He's distraught over the fact that they have rejected the Messiah. And he loves his fellow Jews. He loves them. And he says in Romans 11 that they are enemies of the Gospel. Jesus did not teach, have no enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies. And we do that by patiently correcting and teaching with kindness. The fourth way that you can become a clean vessel is to consider the plight of your opponents. So number four, consider the plight of your opponents. Look at verse 25. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Some commentators see the opponents as wayward Christians who need correction. But I look at the strength of Paul's language here and I see these people as needing salvation. Paul says our opponents are unrepentant. At heart, there is a resistance. They refuse to turn their hearts. There is an obstinacy here. Paul says our opponents are spiritually ignorant. This ignorance comes from a lack of repentance, and if they repented, this would result in a knowledge of the truth. Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. So this is not merely an intellectual issue. There are very intelligent people who reject the gospel because of the hardness of their heart. Oh, how many conversations I've had with very educated PhD people who for some strange reason can't grasp a simple concept like grace. Unmerited, unearned, freely received grace. Total and immediate forgiveness. And it's like, it's just not happening. And they've been to school longer than I have. And they're smarter than I am. Our opponents, Paul says, are also beside themselves. They're trapped by the devil. John Stott describes them as doped, spiritually inebriated. Satan has intoxicated them. They are under, borrowing language from Ephesians 2, under the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. This should provoke compassion and prayer. Lord, please have mercy on our neighbors. They're not thinking straight. They can't see. Satan has put them in a spiritual stupor. My friend Rob says, you wouldn't beat up a physically blind person. Why would we be unkind to a spiritually blind person? The fifth and final way to be cleansed to be a vessel for honorable use, is to trust in God's sovereign grace. Look at verse 25 again. So number five, trust 
in God's sovereign grace. Verse 25, God may perhaps grant them repentance. There is both an optimism and a contentment here. God loves to use His people as a means of bringing others to repentance. This kind of optimism fuels Christians in evangelism and ministry. God loves to save sinners. He loves to use His Word and His people. There's a kind of subtext to every evangelistic encounter. It's like, so you're saying there's a chance. God can save anyone. And when He appoints someone to eternal life, they believe. In Acts 13.48, Luke writes, When the Gentiles heard this, the Gospel, they began rejoicing and glorifying the Word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life, believed. I had a Mormon acquaintance in Utah named Courtney who once wrote, quote, I never understood why the people who seem to be most vocal about evangelism also seem to be more likely to believe that God elects certain people to find the truth. This was certainly the case in Utah. The brothers that love to do evangelism are, in my experience, overwhelmingly believers in God's sovereign grace. You might call them Calvinists today although we don't really identify that position by a person. They are reformed, evangelistic, energizer bunnies. They keep going and going and going. They patiently teach and correct with kindness. If God can breathe life into a valley of dry bones, surely He can bring growth out of Utah's dry desert soil. Let God's election of sinners unto salvation fuel you. He uses His preached Word to accomplish miracles of rebirth, penetrating hard, resistant hearts. God will glorify Himself in this, calling people to Himself who cannot boast of their calling. They can't brag. God, they, they can only say, God did this to me. This was God's gift to me. Paul says in chapter 2, verse 10, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. There is also here a contentment and a peace and a submission. This doesn't ultimately depend on you. God can do what He wants. I heard it once said, sometimes you just have to let God be God. If God wants to grant repentance, He will grant repentance. This reminds me of what Jesus said in John 6, verse 54. No one can come to Me unless it is granted Him by the Father. Because God is sovereign in granting repentance, you can toil, you can work hard in evangelism and ministry and conflict resolution and admonishment, struggling with all the energy that Christ powerfully works within you, and then you could sleep like a baby. Brothers, you are not a lost cause. If you are an unclean vessel... Repent, be forgiven, and be cleansed from what is dishonorable. In review, there are five ways that you can be cleansed as a vessel to be useful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's review. Number one, pursue Christian virtue with pure-hearted believers. Number two, avoid foolish controversies. Three, teach and correct opponents with kindness and patience. Number four, consider the plight of your opponents. And number five, trust in God's sovereign grace. Perhaps you are a visitor here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I have some bad news for you and I have some good news for you. 
you are a sinner. Your problem is not that you are a good person who occasionally does bad things. No, you are a bad person who does bad things. You have violated your conscience and you have violated God's law. Jesus says, whoever sins is a slave to sin. You deserve God's punishment. But God loved the world in this way. He sent His only begotten Son so that those who believe in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is God in the flesh. He lived a perfect life And he went on purpose to Jerusalem to die on a cross. Though Jesus was without sin, he was crucified like a criminal. Jesus died for sinners like you. Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus was buried in a tomb, and three days later, he rose from the dead. He busted out of that tomb, and he walked, and he talked, and he ate fish, and he appeared to the disciples, and he ascended to heaven. He's alive. Someday he will return to judge the living and the dead. His grace is immediately available to you. It is not far off. It is immediately available to you. Jesus offers all of Himself to you. And He commands you to repent and to believe. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. Call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. I will now pray. And we will have a moment of silent reflection. Father in heaven, thank you for your word and thank you for your grace. Please bless my brothers and sisters to be clean vessels, sanctified, zealous for good works, ready and available and useful to the Master. Father, we love your word and we love your Son. Thank you for the gift of salvation and thank you for the privilege of serving you. In the name of Jesus Christ.